back. Oh, we're good to go. to see you, thank you.
But there's Alex. I didn't see. I didn't see Alex. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tom Byrne. I'm the president of the Korea Society. And welcome to the Korea Society. On this date, December 14, in 1950, the Hung Nam evacuation was well underway. Uh, the operation was unprecedented, unprecedented in the annals of US military history. Uh, there were no manuals to plan an operation of such magnitude. And the commanding officers had only 10 days advance notice to plan. Moreover, before and during the evacuation, the Chinese Communist forces continued their attacks against the 10th Corps troops and the perim perimeter of Hung Nam City, uh, which was defended by US and South Korean troops. It was the greatest evacuation by sea in US military history. The Navy transported 105,000 soldiers, 17,500 vehicles, and 350,000 tons of bulk cargo from Hung Nam using 109 ships, some twice. In addition to the military evacuees, 98,100 Korean refugees, civilians, were also evacuated to South Korea, an unforeseen problem for the military planners at the time. On December 23rd, Colonel Forney brought in three old victory ships and two LST vessels to port in Hung Nam. They loaded up 50,000 refugees and took them out of the city. The SS Meredith Victory, a cargo freighter, left Hung Nam on December 23rd and unloaded its refugee passengers safely on December 26th at Koje Island around the southern coast of Pusan. The Meredith Victory's three days sailing from Hung Nam had been, has been called the miracle of Christmas. On the SS Meredith Victory was Admiral J. Robert Lunny, who was an officer at that time. To recount that story, we have both Admiral Lunny and author Ned Forney, grandson of Edward H. Forney, the late deputy chief and the U.S. Marine contingent of 10th Corps in Hung Nam. Ned, uh, thank you for, uh, for traveling uh, in from Seoul to join us this afternoon. Thank you. And Admiral Lunny, uh, thank you for traveling Metro North from Bronxville oh, to join yeah. us <laughs> today. A journey that was not as arduous as your mid-December trip 50 years ago, although you never know given the parlous state of rail infrastructure <laughs> in the New York City metro area. Uh, Ned first went to Korea on a Korea Society-sponsored project in the 1990s. I believe it was an education project? It was. Uh, I'll talk about that. You were a high school teacher, yeah, That's right. right. Yeah. Um, that's something we should start again. He and his family still live in Korea today. The Chosen Ilbo this month profiled Forney's writing and activities in support of recognizing those involved with the Hung Nam evacuation. In June this summer, Ned introduced Korean President Moon Jae-in to Admiral Lunny on President Moon's first official trip to the United States. Admiral Lunny was warmly greeted by President Moon. President Moon's mother, father, and older sister were res rescued and transported on the Meredith Victory during that Christmas miracle. Admiral Lunny, welcome, and we are deeply honored. Uh, the Admiral turns 90 tomorrow, so a warm and happy birthday to you and a joyful holiday to everyone. I'm looking for valuable presents, too. <laughs> <laughs> You're in the right place, Admiral. Thank you. Uh, thank you for coming. Thanks, Tom. Uh, thanks to all of you. A and there is not a more joyful way for us to conclude our 60th anniversary year uh, than to have uh, Admiral Lunny and uh, Ned Forna here. Uh, and to have all of you here, because we see many of our members, uh, friends, board members, uh, journalists, and other supporters. And it's really our deep pleasure at this holiday time. And what a great time to talk about what is indeed a miracle and really a testimonial to the human spirit and to the strength of Korea-US relations. So thank you both for coming. And uh, yeah. Ned, why don't you start us off? Uh, Ned and I first talked about this maybe four or five months ago, right. and uh, he was in on a summer visit and has done some remarkable work over time. Uh, and if you'd like to start, and then we'll move on to Ed Sure, thank you, thank you. Uh, let's see, Peter. Let me get the next slide. Let's see. There we go. 
Uh, first, uh, before I start, I would like to thank all of you to, for coming out during the holiday season. I know there's probably other things you could be doing right now, but um, I appreciate that you've come out. And this is a great story, a truly untold story about the Korean War and about a humanitarian operation during the war. Um, I'm writing a book about it, and the name of the book is going to be The Better Angels, referring back to uh, President Lincoln's 1861 first inaugural speech. And in war, or even in our daily lives, in the crises that come up uh, frequently, living in 21st century America, 21st century world, um, doing the right thing for the right reasons in difficult situations is something that happens all the time. And that's what these men were doing at Hunam. Uh, in my book, there are no heroes. They're just good people doing the right thing for the right reasons in difficult situations. So um, thanking you, and I'd also like to thank Steve and Tom and Jonathan uh, for inviting me and having me here today. And I'd like to thank Bob for being right here. I'm, I'm your co-pilot, Bob. Oh, yes, very good. <laughs> uh, so before we start, uh, I want to just give a, a background on Hunam. So I think most of you know the basics, and Tom did a great job giving you an overview, but I'll go into just a little more detail, and I have some slides that will help uh, bring it to life, hopefully, a little bit. So when you talk about Hunam, you have to start with Chosun, or as we say in Korea, correctly, Changjin. Um, Chosun doesn't exist in Korea. It was a Japanese name. So when the Marines uh, were doing their operation in northeast of North uh, Korea, they pulled out their maps and it said Chosun because the Japanese had made the maps. But correctly, it's Changjin. So I always try to say Changjin. So the Changjin campaign or Chosun campaign started December, uh, excuse me, November 27th. November 27th, 1950, and it went until approximately December 11th of 1950, so about two weeks. Um, during that battle, uh, Changjin is a lake, a reservoir, way up in the mountains of North Korea, and it's isolated, and it was frozen. There was no water there. It was rock solid. You could drive a tank over that reservoir. So the Marines are there, mainly the 1st Marine Division. There's also Army units there. And there's also a, a small unit of Royal British Commandos, and there's also the Rock Troops. But the 1st Marine Division did most of the fighting during that time, and they were surrounded. 30,000 U.S. Rock and British troops and Marines against approximately 120,000 Chinese. And MacArthur and General Almond, many of the high-ranking officials knew there were Chinese in the area, but for some reason, they chose to ignore all the warning signs. So the Americans were basically trapped at the reservoir, and they had to fight their way out. Um, so that slide doesn't have anything to do with Cho Chosen. That's a slide, actually. Uh, I forgot to thank the Korea Society also for letting me start my Korea journey back in 1998, 1998. So that was almost 20 years ago. So there I am with hair, um, with Dr. Hyun uh, to my left, on the right there of the screen. Um, Dr. Hyun, I'll talk more about him. But in 1998, I was a high school teacher. I applied for a grant through the Korea Society. Korea Society sent me to Seoul. I was living in North Carolina at the time as a high school history and English teacher. And I spent approximately 15 days in, uh, in Seoul and in Korea. And I learned a lot about Korean history and Korean culture. And that's where my journey started. And now 20 years later, I'm writing this book um, that really goes back to my first visit to Korea back in 1998. And whoop, there I am, once again with hair. This was uh, my little hometown newspaper writing an article about Ned, the, the teacher, going to Korea. And interestingly, it was written by Stephen Lee, whose grandfather was still living in Seoul. He was Korean American. So when I came to Seoul, I had dinner with him one night. OK. Back to Chosen. Uh, so uh, December, no November 27th, 1950, the Chinese attack. It's a surprise. And they're there with little equipment, 
They have their rifles, they have no air cover, they have no tanks, they really don't even have artillery, mortars and infantry, but the Marines are surrounded. And as I mentioned, the Marines have to break out. MacArthur makes the decision that the Marines can't stay there. They would be annihilated. Mao had actually bragged uh, in, in, in Beijing that he would annihilate the entire 1st Marine Division, which he almost did. But they break out and they have to walk down this road here called the MSR, the main supply route, and they make their way 70 miles to Hunan. It was freezing, freezing cold. So tonight when you go back out on the street, just imagine it would probably 20 to 30 degrees colder than it is tonight. Many Marines froze to death. So they break out and they make their way to Hunam. And I always think about this picture. For every guy in that truck, for every Marine who's made it out of Hunam, they've probably seen at least two or three of their buddies uh, who are still up there. And many of the Marines didn't come back. Their bodies didn't even come back. The fighting was so terrible that we couldn't even bring the dead back with us. So with the Marines now, and with the Army units, and with the British units, and with the ROC units back at Hunam, it's now up to this man, Colonel Edward H. Forney, my grandfather, uh, who I never knew. He died uh, when I was two years old. He died in 1965. He was only 55 when he passed away from cancer. But I heard stories about him, mainly from Dr. Hyun, uh, when I came to Korea. Uh, so Colonel Forney now is in charge of the operation. General Almond, the commander of 10th Corps, Colonel Forney is attached to 10th Corps. He's been told, here's what you need to do. You're the Marine. When all the guys come down to Hunam, figure out a way to get them on the ships, do it quickly, efficiently, and I want everything out. Not just the Marines and not just the soldiers, but all their tanks, all their equipment, all their artillery, all their fuel. So here are the Marines leaving the jeeps, the tanks, the fuel, and you can kind of see what it looked like there at Hunam. This is actually a blood supply. So they put everything onto the ships. During that time, or actually a little bit before that, Dr. Hyun Bong Hak had been attached to the 10th Corps also. He was from North Korea. His hometown was Hamhung, which is about 10 miles from Hunam. So he gets attached to 10th Corps because he speaks English extremely well. He had gone to medical school in Richmond, Virginia. General Almond, the commander of 10th Corps, when he met Dr. Hyun, when they were, he was translating for the general, the general said, you, uh, you're, you're English. You have a kind of a slight accent. It's very familiar. And Dr. Hyun says, well, yeah, I, I went to a school in America, in Richmond, Virginia. And Almond says, I'm from Virginia. So they immediately became good friends. And Dr. Hyun, at that point, was working for the ROC Marine Corps. General Almond tells the general of ROC Marine Corps, he's coming with us. So he goes with the 10th Corps and spends the rest of his uh, Korean War uh, career with the 10th Corps. So he's there. And at the operation, there are hundreds of thousands of Korean, North Korean civilians who have left their homes. And now they want, they've heard rumors that maybe the US forces will let them get on the ships. So Dr. Hyun pleads over and over to General Allman. Sir, can you put the refugees on the ships? And General Alman says, no, we can't do that. It's a breach of security. We don't have enough space. It's just not possible. And Hyun would go back over and over again. And Forney and Hyun had become friends. Uh, so Forney also really liked, obviously, Dr. Hyun and said, I'll, I'll try to help you too. So then Forney and Hyun would go to General Almond. 
and General Almond was, you know, he, he had a big job to do. He had to get all the guys out and it was, it was going to be tough just to, just to do that part. But finally, General Almond says, yes, at the very end, the last few days, somebody, General Almond, MacArthur, who knows exactly, I can't find the exact, you know, telegram or, or document that says who gave the green light. But long story short, they were allowed to put the refugees on the ships. Where? On top of the tanks, under the tanks, on top of the fuel, wherever they could fit them. So that's what Colonel Forney did. This is an LST, a landing ship tank. So these are ships designed for tanks. The, the front opens, the bow opens, the tanks go in, and the refugees would go in also. And there they are. Thousands. When the Americans finally left, 100,000 refugees had left aboard the American ships. They estimate today that there are approximately 1 million descendants of those 100,000 refugees. And Moon Jae-in is one of them, the current president of uh, the Republic of Korea. This ship was one of the ships that left. It was one of the final ships to pull out. It's a, Bob Lunny was on this ship. This is the SS Meredith Victory. It is now the symbol of all the ships that were at Hungnam. There were over 90 ships. Not all 90 ships took civilians, but this ship represents all the ships that had civilians aboard. And Bob Lunny has done a great job keeping the memory of this ship alive and of the captain, Captain Leonard LaRue. So when this ship pulls out, 14,000 refugees are on board this ship. So to put that into context, the, the ships that we see down in Miami, 20, 20 stories high, huge. They're 10 times the size of this ship. They usually float, or they usually sail with 8,000 people on board. So you imagine when you see those ships pull into the port and all the people streaming out, that's 8,000. This ship had 14,000. So, with that said, um, I'm going to turn it over to Bob because Bob was there. He was on that ship. He saw the refugees loading, and he worked very closely with Captain Leonard LaRue. He was the purser, mm. and whenever things happened, Captain LaRue would turn to Bob. So, Bob, I'm going to turn it over to you. Well, it's a very interesting account, and it brings back old memories, back to 1950, just this time of the year. <clears throat> uh, just for some background, um, I'm a World War II veteran, having served a year in the Pacific with the Naval Amphibious Forces, uh, operating out of Saipan, finished college um, under the GI Bill in June 1950, and received a call in July 1950, if you remember, the Korean War began on June 25th, 1950 and the Military Sea Lift Command gave us a call, and I, amongst 12 other officers and 35 crew, were airlifted right down to uh, Norfolk, Virginia. And we took out a ship from the laid-up fleet, that's the Mothball Fleet in the James River. It was the SS Meredith Victory. That was on July 28th. We sailed the next day, expedited through the canal, up to Oakland, California, loaded um, uh, army uh, material, equipment, trucks, jeeps, uh, mostly uh, vehicles, uh, direct to Yokohama. We offloaded Yokohama uh, and immediately combat loaded uh, for the uh, Incheon landing. Uh, we, we sailed uh, and landed our troops. Uh, we had a regimental combat team of the uh, 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 I believe it was the 31st uh, RCT, the Regimental Combat Team of the 7th Infantry Division at um, Incheon. Uh, we uh, sustained one enemy air attack, but we were able to successfully put all of our elements ashore at Incheon, at uh, what we called Blue Beach, and evacuating 
uh, in China at that time, we would you believe, took the surrender of uh, 13 North Korean um, soldiers coming out in a sailboat waving a white flag. Here we are aboard a ship uh, ready to return to Yokohama when we have 13 uh, Korean soldiers surrendering to our ship. We radioed the Navy. Navy said, take them all aboard and return to, to uh, Yokohama. Soon after uh, arriving in Yokohama, we made any number of uh, trips back and forth, supplying the uh, UN forces, especially American, at, uh, in uh, Korea, uh, making trips back into Incheon, into Busan. Uh, and then in December, in the middle of December 1950, we received emergency orders at uh, Tokyo to deliver, would you believe, 10,000 tons of jet fuel in drums. Keep in mind, we were a cargo ship. We loaded as quickly as we could and transited the uh, um, uh, east coast of Korea right up to Hongnam. That was our destination, uh, which is about, uh, uh, I would say, approximately in your mind's eye, it's about 300 miles just south of Vladivostok, the big naval, uh, Soviet naval uh, base up there. And uh, we transited the east coast of, uh, of Korea. And uh, keep in mind that this is a heavily mined area. We lost three mine sweepers um, sweeping these mines up the east coast of Korea. And as we entered the harbor of um, Hongnam, and this is in the middle of December 1950, with 10,000 tons of jet fuel, we were stopped by a minesweeper on entering the harbor. Um, and because we were under radio silence, they send over what we call in the Navy a Lyle gun to get a message to us as to, you know, from whence did we come and what are our destination, what are we carrying, how many souls do we have aboard, etc. We, 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 we put a message back, they hauled it in, and to their amazement, you could see the crew of that minesweeper looking at us with carrying 10,000 tons of jet fuel, trying to get through a minefield. They gave us orders, maintain 2,500 yards behind us, and they had just swept a a, 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 a clean-swept area through the minefield, and uh, they said maintain 2,500 yards behind us. We did. We tried to do that, but you can imagine that minesweeper kept getting farther and farther and farther away from us. They didn't want to be anywhere near a ship carrying <laughs> 10,000 tons of jet fuel in, in the middle of a minefield. Uh, we did get in there. This is in the middle of December 1950, when we could see even see through our binoculars, and we received reports that the airfield, there was a marine fighter strip called Yanpo that we were to supply. They were just introducing the new jets, the new jet fighter. If you remember, the, I think it was the uh, um, uh, F-86 Sabre jet was being introduced at that time, and we were coming in to supply this airfield with the jet fuel for these jets, etc. Uh, but in the meanwhile, the Chinese were coming down more rapidly than, than expected. The uh, airfield we could see through our binoculars was overcome by heavy enemy pressure. The orders were given to us to, to take this jet fuel out again through the harbor, this mined harbor, and, get, and take it down to Pusan and offload at Pusan. We transit through, through the minefield again with this 10,000 tons, Get down to Pusan, which is just south in the southeast corner. If you, some of you can direct your eyes on that map, uh, which I brought up to give you some idea of the geography. And we got down there and commenced discharging as rapidly as we could. Uh, however, we received radio orders again to proceed north to Hongnam. We had almost completed offloading the jet fuel, but we still had 300 tons of jet fuel in our lower holds, I think it was number two and number three hold, when we still had the jet fuel, but they ordered us to proceed as rapidly as possible. The Chinese were closing rapidly around the port of, of Hongnam. And as uh, Ned mentioned earlier, the, the Chinese had not only encircled that port, but they had advanced so far south, there were no land routes uh, to escape from Hongnam at that time. 
think of the map of uh, Korea as a, just a half moon around uh, Hong Nam. That's the only position that we were, the UN position that we were holding at that time. The, by the time we got back up there, and this is about December 20th, 21st, uh, 1950, they had already evacuated the 1st Marine Corps, the 7th Marine Corps had been evacuated. They were taking out the uh, ROC, the Republic of Korea, a ROC division at that, at that time. The 3rd Infantry Division was still holding the line. Keep in mind that they had set up a perimeters surrounding the port, and uh, as the uh, Chinese were advancing, the perimeters were folding one into the other, so that by the time we got up there, the Navy, the, uh, that is the Army representatives that came out to our ship, we were one of the last ships in the harbor at that time, came out to tell us that the Chinese were probably between four and 5,000 yards from the, from the port, and we were in the inner harbor at that time, and they asked the captain, because of the vast number of refugees crowding the beach at that time, but they were coming in by the thousands. Think of this. These are Korean, North Korean refugees leaving all of their towns, homes, and villages in North Korea where they had lived under communism for five years and of seek, seeking freedom, uh, sacrifice every, uh, everything from towns and villages where their families had lived for hundreds of years. It was freezing cold winter. Uh, most of the young men were already in the military. These were thousands of mostly women and children and elderly men huddled on the beach, and they were still still coming into Hong Nam, seeking, seeking access to the ships. We were the last ship in the harbor. As Ned had mentioned earlier, with Dr. Hyun and his grandfather, they had put together any number of uh, refugees into all of the naval ships as possible. When General Alman gave the order, uh, because General MacArthur, Douglas MacArthur in Tokyo had said, start taking on as many Korean refugees as possible. The first segment of those refugees were the ones that had worked closely with the Americans when they had arrived. These were the liaison and the uh, leaders of the uh, Korean, uh, North Korean communities that had been fighting the, the, uh, the communists, and they were all taken out first but then this massive number of other refugees was on the beach. And um, our captain agreed with the army representatives when they explained all of the exigencies to him. They said, you're one of the last ships in the harbor, but we must tell you, we cannot order you to go in because of the exigencies. The, 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 the Chinese were, were, wasn't like miles. The army had set up strong points several thousand yards are surrounding the port. Um, they had set up a command post on the beach in a cave. Um, the, we had the full support of the seventh fleet in the harbor. We had three or four aircraft carriers off the horizon supporting us. I would just add one footnote. One of them was the USS Leyte CV-32. And incidentally, I had done my naval duty aboard the Leyte just the year before 1949 myself, so I was very familiar with the Leyte. But the Leyte was out there with two other carriers. I think one of them was the Princeton. Uh, but they were supporting us with as much air support as possible, mostly F4U Corsairs, and the, uh, the, the, the jets were being introduced at that time. But uh, we had the firepower of the um, USS Missouri, 16-inch shells firing into all of the Chinese positions. Uh, uh, this was all, all over our head. We had about eight destroyers lined up in the swept channels of the uh, mine, minefields, firing their, their five, five inch shells into the Chinese positions. We had uh, four, th three, I, I think, LSMRs, the landing ship medium uh, rocket ships. Uh, we had as much support as possible in the, in the in the course of naval, air, and, and gunfire support, uh, the, uh, the, the Army then 
had us go in because there was no more open docks or piers. We tied up to another ship. The Army engineers built a causeway across that ship. The ship was the, US, the SS North Cuba, and she was loading military supplies. The, 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 the evacuees, the, the refugees, came down to the pier, climbed over this uh, um, wooden um, uh, transit across the North Cuba into our ship. Our captain, Captain Leonard P. LaRue, had ordered that we uh, take on as many as possible. We were a cargo ship. We started loading these people into every cargo hold we had. Uh, the, the ship had three holds forward of the house and two aft of the house. And each hold had three levels uh, to uh, each of the holds. We commenced loading um, uh, as many people into these cargo holds as possible, lowering down, them down with booms uh, in, into the holds on, on pallets. Uh, the booms would lower them down as, uh, as deep as they could. The ship is about, I would give you an approximate idea, about 450 feet long and maybe 50 feet wide. The depths of the cargo holds were 38 to 40 feet, depending on, on uh, which, which hold you were looking at. We, we filled each of the holds with as much of the refugees as possible, but each hold had, a, had pontoon levels to them. We would fill one level, and keep in mind the three levels in each hold, and covered each level with pontoons, leaving one open to allow air to come down into these holes. We had no heat, we had no electricity, we had no food, we had no water, we had no doctor, we had no interpreter. These Korean people came aboard. Uh, women were feeding their babies. Uh, uh, the older men had young children under their overcoats trying to keep them warm. The weather was freezing weather. We filled each of the five holes, and then we, the captain ordered that we commence loading the last of the refugees on the beach. Keep in mind, we're the last ship uh, taking out the refugees. And we, we placed them on the weather decks. That's the open decks on the ship. Uh, I think earlier, and maybe they're going to show it again to give you some view of what that, the ship looked like, at least on its deck, of just crowded people. Um, when you can imagine, there was hardly any place to sit down. They had no food. They were instructed to bring as much food and as, as much uh, water that they could. We had no way to feed them. We commenced sailing out of, of the harbor on December 23rd. While we were loading the ship with the refugees, the UDT, the Underwater Demolition Teams, that's in what we call, uh, I forget what they call them seals. now, uh, seals. The, the SEALs, the, the, the SEALs today, they were placing explosives throughout the port. Uh, up. I could, you could see them uh, dropping underwater demolitions throughout the, the very pier uh, we were at. Uh, to, an, to eventually, as we left the port, exploded <clears throat> to destroy the entire port, to de deny access to the enemy or it's used to the enemy at, uh, at all. Uh, so that uh, we were finished loading, and then the order was given uh, to haul anchor. In the meanwhile, we had the ship positioned so that she was facing out to sea. We had the boilers running slowly on the way, in, in a sense like a getaway car, ready to get underway in case the Chinese uh, broke through the last perimeter, the 3rd Infantry was taking casualties. Uh, when, you, when you think about it, men were f fighting and dying, enabling us to load the refugees. Uh, in any event, 
Um, we did get out uh, the Missouri was anchored just near us, and I could see some of the, the men on the Missouri coming up and looking at this ship, our ship loaded with humanity. In every space, in every deck, every open deck, crowded in all of our holes, etc., And we were able to navigate out through the minefield uh, and proceeded south along the east coast of Korea. If you look at that map later, you'll see the, the course that we took down. Our orders were to, to, to go directly to Pusan. En route to Pusan, five babies were born. There were, think of it. Uh, uh, for Jesus facetiously, we uh, named them uh, uh, because uh, none of us knew much about Korean. We named them kimchi, one, two, three, four, and five, uh, uh, et, et cetera. Uh, one other experience uh, I recall on the trip down was that uh, the captain, Captain Leonard LaRue, who was just a, a, an outstanding man, a very religious man, noticed a thin column of smoke coming out of the number three hole. That's the, the hole just forward of the house. And we sent it down a couple of men to investigate. And we found that uh, uh, the Korean refugees were setting fires down uh, in this hole, trying to keep warm and to heat food. But they were setting the fires <laughs> atop these drums of jet fuel. Um, and uh, you can imagine our concern. Uh, I'm not sure of the combustibility of jet fuel, um, but uh, well, it gave us great concern. We got some men down there to uh, investigate and to try to instruct the, 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 the Korean refugees as to not to build fires. And we finally got that across. But we did get down to Busan on December 23rd, I believe. Uh, um, it took us about uh, 28 to 30 hours just to get down to uh, Busan. And um, after that, I should also indicate to you, it took us about 14 hours to load the 14,000 people. We were the last ship out with refugees. Um, but by the time we got down into Busan, uh, we were denied uh, the opportunity to offload them. The Chinese had been advancing down, as Ned had mentioned earlier, um, several hundred thousand Chinese had entered the war and were sweeping down the peninsula of Korea. I pass on to you, if you recall in your mind's eye, Seoul had changed hands four times during this war. The enemy had swept down once north, pushed them north twice, four times Seoul had changed hand. You can imagine the poor people in Korea that suffered. I understand that both North and South Korea lost more than two million people during that war. We lost uh, maybe amongst our American uh, soldiers and sailors and Marines, uh, uh, Coast Guard, uh, maybe 36,000 men and uh, maybe double that, uh, triple that, and, and wounded. At Pusan, we were denied entry into the port because the Chinese were coming down and circling the port of Pusan. Uh, they said, well, you can't offload here. They put on some food. Meanwhile, we had taken 17 um, wounded during the embarkation at uh, Hong Nam. They at least allowed us to, to disembark the 17 wounded at, at Pusan. They put aboard some food, but we were just allowed to maybe feed, feed some of the people on the deck. We were not able to even get down into the holes at all. Can you imagine these poor refugees were down there now for two or three days? No food, no water, um, and freezing cold with children. Uh, we were able to take care of the five babies. We had a very small infirmary aboard the ship. Um, but uh, 
At that point, we received orders to, as Ned told you, to take the refugees and sail to an island to the just southwest of Pusan called Koji. K, we spelled it K-O-J-E, Koji Do in, in Korean means island, Koji Do. And we were able to offload there, but when we arrived there, they had no dock, they had no pier, there was no way we could get, get them ashore. Uh, but the, the Navy, uh, then the next day, December 26th, we arrived there Christmas Day, December 25th, the Navy the next day, 26th, sent out two LSTs, landing ship tanks, and they were tied up next to us, one on either side. We were able to offload all of the Korean refugees into these LSTs that took them ashore. And I must note, uh, some of you Koreans in the audience would appreciate this, that uh, some of those Koreans did the traditional half bow. Uh, and thanks when they left our ship. But we were able to offload and disembark 14,005 people alive at the island of Kojido. And I would add one postscript, which is very important to me. Um, our captain, Captain Leonard P. LaRue, left the sea in 1954 and uh, joined the Benedictine order at St. Paul's Abbey in Newton, New Jersey, and uh, took the name Brother Marinus as a monk, and he lived out the last rest of his life as a monk at St. Paul's Abbey, and that was about 40 years later that he died in the year 2001. And uh, to this day, on, only recently, a group, a Catholic group called the Apostleship of the Sea is, has taken steps with Rome to have him named as a saint, not only for his rescue in, um, of the refugees in North Korea, but his full life of heroic virtue and his uh, re religious um, works throughout his uh, entire career. Uh, he was a graduate of, the, uh, of a school ship in Philadelphia in 1934 and sailed the entire World War II aboard merchant ships, the Merman's Run, etc. But he was a marvelous man. And to this day, I do think a lot of my character was born by having served under a man of that eminence and of that stature. And I will always take back a part in my heart of the Korean people because the true heroes, we talk about what we did and we're honored to some extent by the Korean people, but the true heroes were the Korean people themselves willing to sacrifice so much to seek freedom. We're proud to have preserved the integrity of the nation and the freedom of its people, but the, the, the Korean people were the, were the true heroes and we, we treasure that very much. And we look now at what Korea has accomplished. When you think, when we left Korea at the end of the war, all that was left in all of these towns and villages were, were chim, chim, chimneys in their villages. Uh, every, everything had been wiped out. And we were back there, my wife and I, my wife Joan here is with me today, but we, we went back. I, I forget what was the celebration at that time. It was a big, uh, uh, I'm sorry, I can't hear you. The 50th anniversary at the end of the war, to see what Korea had done, uh, uh, because it was just marvelous for someone like, like myself, I had been there during the war and seen the entire peninsula leveled, uh, and to see the success of the Korean people, and was so proud to have that relationship with Korea today. And indeed, the president of Korea, President Moon, invited Joan and myself down to uh, Quantico, Virginia, uh, to meet with him because he uh, acknowledged to us and was so pleased to meet a representative of the, of the ship. His mother and father and his older sister were rescued by our ship out of Hongnam 
uh, in December 1950. He later was born, two years later, he was born on the island of Koji. But he said in his uh, remarks at Quantico, he said, except for Captain LaRue, the Meredith Victory, I would not be alive and I would not be here today. And I thank them so much for having saved my life. And that's the story of the Meredith Victory and my captain, Captain Leonard P. LaRue. Admiral Lunny, thank you. I and wish my mother-in-law were here to hear all this <laughs> applause. Well, fortunately, we have both audio podcast and video, so she'll have plenty of time to do that. And this will play in many classrooms and to many people, I'm sure, on download. Uh, let's open it up for about 10 minutes of uh, a question or dialogue, or if you had any comments or thoughts that you would like to offer to either uh, Ned or to Bob. If please. the questions are not too hard. <laughs> <laughs> please, Homer. Oh, yes. <laughs> so that uh, gives some idea of how much space was put in 14,000 people. Can you give a contrast about how many people were in the uh, regimental combat team that you landed in Incha? How many people? Do you have any idea? Well, we, we the principal function of our ship at Incheon during that landing, that was September 15, 1950. I'll give you a personal footnote to that. September 15, 1950 was the day I was entered to enter Cornell Law School. That, that very day. Uh, uh, and we were landing, we were landing a, a regimental combat team, part of a regimental combat team. The, most of our cargo was the tanks, uh, equipment that we had the, the uh, six spies, the six, the, what we call the six spies, the six rear vehicles with a 50 caliber machine gun mount next to the driver. We had all of the trailers loaded with ammunition. Um, we, we carried pretty much uh, a skeleton crew, but of, of the regimental combat team, and these were the drivers, the tankers, as you would call them in the army, that took the tanks ashore. Because the main thing that we had to do at Blue Beach during the invasion was to get the tanks ashore. And because of the high tides, um, I'm sure that a lot of you have done your history, know the high tides in Incheon were 35 to 40 feet, so that our ship could not get in to the port, port itself, uh, the shore side. We had to uh, anchor off uh, in, in, in the outer harbor and offload into LSTs to get our tanks and equipment ashore. So I think we carried between 50 and 100 of the tankers that were, were to operate the tanks. Um, Later on, uh, some of the men on, on the ship, not having been in the Navy as I was, <laughs> complained about the way the Army uh, uh, um, loaded the ship. They said, why in the world did they put the heaviest items on, on the top? Because we had to go through a typhoon, by the way. And of course, I knew the, the first thing you had to do on any landing, I had served a year in the Pacific with the Navy, was you had to get the tanks ashore first. So they had to be uh, at the highest levels of the ship because the first things we got onto the LSTs were the tanks to get them ashore. And then later on, got the, the ammunition and the trucks and the, and the trailers. 
because that was secondary. The main thing was to get the tanks in, and we offloaded them into the LSTs. The LSTs went into the beach, offloaded the tanks, and then came out uh, but uh, uh, w with the tide, etc. cetera. And uh, the, thus, we were comparatively successful. We only had, uh, the only interruption we had, the uh, enemy uh, sent out, uh, I believe it was three uh, um, fighter bombers, and um, they attacked the... Uh, um, section where we were, uh, the USS Rochester happened to be there as well. Uh, we, we met the Rochester again up at Hong Dam. But the Rochester failed to commence firing uh, because uh, no one expected us to be under an air attack. But the HMS uh, Jamaica, which we had Jamaica, uh, the uh, 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 Royal Navy uh, cruiser right behind us, they shot down two of them. I think one of them got away. But uh, that was the, the biggest excitement we had at Incheon. But uh, it, that was three months before Hong Nam, and we were involved in a number of other operations as well, supplying and equipping and, and bringing uh, trips back and forth from Japan. See, most of your operations were out of Japan to supply the UN operation in Korea at that time, uh, ammunition, troops, equipment, uh, et cetera. So, uh, um, uh, it brings back my memory of Incheon. Uh, incidentally, um, uh, the Koreans here will uh, appreciate. Now we'll, there's a whole new vocabulary. Incheon, when we were there, it was spelled I N C H O N. Now it's I N C H E O N. And Busan is no longer Busan. It's Busan. B U S A N. So we 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 had to learn all the new pronunciations and the new names. Were there any more questions? Please, in the back. Um, I can bring a mic to you if you want. Um, thank you for the story. Um, and I was just curious, um, I first uh, learned about the story actually uh, from the movie Ode to My Father. <laughs> Uh, and then I got really interested in learning the backstory, and I uh, found out that um, the Captain LaRue, um, when he joined the, I guess, the Benedict Abbey out in Newton, um, there is a Christmas tree farm out there. So I've been wanting to um, get my next Christmas tree out there for a couple of years since we moved back to New York. Uh, my question to you is, um, as a merchant um, ship, um, what are kind of the things that might have gone through um, the captain's head um, as he was making that decision um, to, it is not, as you said, it's a cargo ship. It is not built to carry passengers. But in that process of um, re now, um, the enemy is closing in and in that decision-making process, what kind of um, questions would he have asked him, uh, his crew, and also back to whomever um, that he needed to report back to? What were, um, and what were some of the things that without that clear communication um, that he would have to, he had to kind of assume the decision and the results of that, not knowing how successful this operation would be? Steve, maybe you can help me on what? Sure. What, what, in essence, what do you think went through the captain's mind in how he had to make his decision? Um, in our visits down through the years with, with Captain LaRue, then Brother Marinus, he uh, always complained to me, not always complained to me, it's a bad expression, but he said that many people who came to the Abbey were always pressing him to speak about the dramatic rescue, the humanitarian rescue at Hong Nam, and he chose not to. Uh, I was able to speak to him very frankly and openly because I sailed with him. I was the administrative aide to the master. My cabin was immediately adjacent to his uh, aboard the ship. Um, he said, he simply did the right thing. And that was the only conclusion that he came to. 
in, in that regard. Um, he, when I pressed him to explain to our son, Joan and I brought Alexander, who's here with us now, down on a visit because it was very important for me to have Alexander meet and talk with Captain LaRue. I said to Captain LaRue, I said, explain to Alex why you undertook that. When the, the Army representatives came out and they said, we asked you to gather your men, your officers together. There were 12 of us. We gathered together in what we call an emergency ship, the saloon in the Navy, it's called the wardroom. We hate to use the term saloon because it has another <laughs> reaction to people. We, we did gather in the saloon, but uh, let's call it the wardroom. Um, he, he was asked to gather his officers together and they would give him an opportunity to confer. He neither talked to his left nor his right. He just immediately said, I will take my ship in and we will take out as many as we can. He, his view was when he responded to Alexander's inquiry, he said it was a mass of humanity on the beach, human beings on the beach. He said, albeit we're in enemy territory, and he did not see, see them as North Koreans or South Koreans. He didn't see them as uh, communists or non-communists, or combatants or non-combatants. All he did in his mind's eye was see human beings on the beach searching for freedom and access to the sea to be saved. And that was all that was in his mind. So that there never came a time when he considered anything else. And that, that was his pure, um, unencumbered thinking. Later, he, he said in one of his few writings, he said, as I look back on that Christmas tide, on those rough and cruel waters off the east coast of Korea, he said, God's hand was at the helm of my ship. So, he, he didn't wear his religion on his sleeve. He, he practiced his own Christian philosophy as best he could, all being a merchant mariner. Um, he was a very good man, a man of good virtue, um, so that having sailed with him, having worked with him, having visited him, having known him all these years, he was a very good man. And uh, as I said earlier, he's being acknowledged by the apostleship of the sea that came about the interest of Captain LaRue in the saving of all these lives by themselves and came upon me because the book, uh, you'll see it up here, Ship of Miracles, written by um, Bill, um, Bill Gilbert. Gibson, I think it is, uh, Bill Gilbert, uh, uh, mentions a, a lot of what I had told him. And um, so um, he, he was a good man. And, you know, sometimes they tell you, how can one man change anything? And we all know as Christmas comes about, that one man is one we honor today on Christmas Day. But aboard that ship, it was Captain LaRue, and he was a good man. I don't know whether that answers your question, but it's the best I can. But Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Admiral Lunny. And we'll have a chance to ask more questions to Admiral Lunny and to Ned and in our reception here, which will begin in just a moment. Uh, and really, your, your gift today is one that we'll take into the holidays, and we thank you so much for what you've given us here today and for your service then and since. And I know Ned wanted to lead us uh, in a final salute to you by way of happy birthday, so if you'd all join us. Tomorrow is your 90th birthday, Bob. 90th birthday. So I think it would be appropriate if we all sang happy birthday to Bob. Very in in Korean. <laughs> <laughs> we'll do our best. Can I just make one comment? Yes, sir. I was born during Korean War in Busan. You said about Kaji or Kajedo. 
And Busan is the most southern port of Korea. Without 38,000 American troops who shed their blood in Korean battlefield, I would not be able to be here because mm -hmm. as a soul light, we moved down to Busan. We were pushed down to Busan and because of American troops and 16 allied countries, I mean, those soldiers from allied countries, I could be here. Mm -hmm. So my comment is lots of thanks. And we call that kunjal, half, you said half something bow. So I want to give you almost kunjal. Actually, I'm supposed to kneel down, but I cannot do that here. So let me give you, you know, true kunjal to you, okay? We thank you so much. We're so grateful thank to you. you. Thank you. Good? Okay. Hana Tool Set. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Bob. Happy birthday to you. Ladies and gentlemen, Admiral Lunny, Ned Fornay, thank you both. Please join us for a reception here. We'll have uh, food and wines, beer, and lots of other offerings out here in the back of the room for the next 45 minutes. At 5.15, we'll also have a toast with some of our board members here on stage to mark the 60th anniversary of the Korea Society's first board meeting. It was actually December 12th of uh, 1957. And in attendance were Edward R. Murrow, Cardinal Spellman, and others, and so we'll <laughs> celebrate that as well. And thank you, Jonathan. Yeah, thank you. Thank you to Jonathan. Thank you to Peter and our thank entire you. team here. That's very good. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there you go. Thank you. Now you do have thank to you. make a wish. Thank you all for coming, and we look forward to the reception. Thank you. A very happy holiday.